leave their homes pretty quickly. Uh, and of course, tsunami war warnings much, much wider as well. Let's uh, look here at the various different times that the uh, experts expect the tsunami to strike. Uh, obviously, the epicenter, three hours from the time it hit, uh, six hours, nine hours, 12 hours. As I said, just beyond the six hour point now, we know there was an island, uh, the Wake Islands, just uh, about here. It hit there about an hour or so ago, uh, and we know that the waves at that point were about six foot high. Uh, devastating for that island because the highest point is just 12 foot but not necessarily huge waves. They are expected to strike Hawaii any time now, and we'll find out probably in the next half hour or so how bad and indeed how high those waves are. Moving on though, the Philippines, certainly another area uh, that is expected to be hit. Uh, waves of more than three feet high, but as yet no reports of injuries or indeed damage. Aid agencies are particularly worried about the situation in Papua New Guinea, not a wealthy country. Much of the population there lives uh, on or along the coastline. Charities concerned about the, the country's ability to deal with the tsunami. Moving further west, uh, we can see that Hawaii, clearly as I just mentioned, is a concern. Uh, our correspondent Robert Nisbet is there. He said that he's seen uh, the water receding somewhat, a, a classic sign that the tsunami is on its way. A few waves already, nothing particularly big, big. although the uh, Civil Ag uh, Defence Agency is still evacuating people who live near the coastline, people being told to get up into high buildings as well. America, of course, concerns there too. We know that the states of uh, Oregon, of Alaska, and further down uh, as well into uh, California, and right the way through Central America and South America, all could be affected. All right, Mark, we're going to go to Hawaii now. Our correspondent Robert Nisbet is there for us. Uh, Mark, saying what you saw earlier, uh, you're describing the, the wave, the tide receding. What's happening now, Robert? Well, we're just hearing a press conference at the uh, Tsunami Pacific Warning Center talking about uh, the effects uh, so far that they have witnessed. And they say that the worst that they've seen so far is a two meter high surge um, on the island of Maui. Uh, which is uh, to uh, which is not Oahu where I am in Honolulu, Hawaii. Obviously, is a, is a chain of islands. The first uh, island to see any kind of activity, wave activity, was Kauai, which is the furthest west. Uh, and according to scientists, it takes half an hour for one of these waves to travel all across the uh, the uh, islands in Hawaii. Now, the top line, I think, from, uh, from this press conference is that they are not expecting a major event in Hawaii. They are expecting damage. Uh, they say it could be widespread, but they are not expecting a major event. Uh, having said that, uh, they are still watching uh, all of the indices that are carrying on at the moment. And obviously, the one that's causing them the most concern is what Mark was just talking about, the water pulling back. And it's extraordinary to see so much reef exposed just waiting for the water to come back and fill it. And this is what they're trying to say to people. This is an unpredictable, dynamic event. Stay high and dry. I'm on uh, the eighth floor of my hotel. Uh, there is what they call a vertical evacuation going on here, Lorna, where people are told to go above the third floor and stay there and listen for further instructions. Right. Well, how do those further instructions come? How are people in, keeping in touch with what's going on? Well, the mayor of Honolulu is reaching out to the managers of the hotels who are then communicating the information uh, to the people inside those hotels. That is at least what is meant to happen. Uh, we haven't heard anything from our uh, hotel manager, although we have been calling down and speaking uh, to him to find out the latest situation. To describe the scene a few hours ago, because it is 10 past four in the morning here, uh, but a few hours ago at about nine, 10 o'clock at night, when it started to become clear that Hawaii could be in the path uh, of the tsunami, there, there was extraordinary activity around here. We saw uh, people uh, panic buying in shops, uh, pulling water and dry food into trolleys. Uh, we saw people queuing up outside petrol stations. At one petrol station near here, 30 cars deep leading up to, uh, to the pumps there. And the road in front of our hotel was just jam solid. Now it is very quiet, but I think this is what they're most concerned about. They're worried that people will think it's all over because they, the first wave hit and it wasn't as, uh, as bad as had been feared, and that people would go out and, and see for themselves. Uh, and they're trying to make it clear to people that this is an event and that could go on for several hours. All right, Robert, keep us posted, won't you, for now. Thank you very much. Well, police in the Sendai region, that's the, the area that's been worst affected, say, between two and 300 bodies have been found along the coast there. The victims, the police are saying, appear to have drowned as a result of the wave. 
They are also warning that the death toll is expected to rise considerably as emergency service workers assess the various areas. Let's take you live to Tokyo. I'm going to speak to CBS correspondent Lucy Craft. Uh, Lucy, afternoon to you. Um, <laughs> What's the situation there now in Tokyo? Is, is clear up starting or is it a monitoring process? Um, well, reports are filtering in um, of more deaths, more people missing. Um, we don't really know. We're really right in the middle of this. By the way, I should add, uh, first of all, I'm in the middle of uh, the newsroom of one of Japan's major networks, and it's very lively, as you can tell right now, so it's a little bit noisy. Um, you know, we're hearing scattered reports. We, we do know that at least at this point about 100 people have been, uh, are, are dead, uh, 400 said to be missing. Um, we did get a report earlier that two to 300 bodies were found on the streets of one of the hardest hit areas. So the situation very much in flux right now. Um, the airport, as I mentioned earlier, in northern Japan, the major airport, Sendai Airport, completely covered one of the early casualties uh, of a huge tsunami. Um, the entire coast of Japan under tsunami wash. This is highly irregular. We've never had this in, in, in modern Japanese history. So it's, the, the whole situation is, is very remarkable. There are aftershocks. Are there likely to be more tsunamis that follow any of those aftershocks? Um, it's anyone's guess. We, the, the aftershocks from this quake have been just off the map. Um, I've lived in Japan for three decades. I've never experienced something of, of this magnitude. Normally we have earthquakes of all kinds, large and small, uh, throughout the week. You don't even notice them. You don't even stop your work or sometimes you don't even wake up from sleep. It's just so common. But this one, it, it just went on and on for many minutes and then the aftershocks kept coming. We have, we've had over a dozen already this evening and we're warned that there could be more. So it's, it's, it's really an anal analogous situation. And we'll take some time to discover what anomalous, exactly, I say. Yeah, what, what actually did happen along that coastal bit of the island where Sendai is and north of that. Are these uh, very populated areas along that coastline? Yes, the, the major area uh, near the epicenter is an area called Sendai. That is sort of the, the most populated area in the uh, Tohoku, the, north, uh, the northeastern area of Japan. These are not the major population centers of Japan, which are Tokyo, Osaka, Nagoya, which, which is the area that we're in. Nagoya, Osaka being more to the west, they haven't been affected at all. Um, but, you know, there are millions of people living up there, so the, 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 the casualty toll could be quite severe. I'm um, just hearing that the Coast Guard in Japan are searching for a ship with 80 people that were on board that they believe was washed away by the tsunami. I mean, do, does Japan have the resources, the, the expertise to be able to deal with such a disaster? I mean, if, if any country, I, it's, it's, it's a question whether any country could prepare itself for, you know, the worst possible earthquake. Um, when you're living in an area, a country that's as populated as Japan, 120 million, million people live in this country, um, it's, it's very difficult to safeguard every part of, this, of, the, of the nation. We've got four major islands, it's a very large uh, land area. Um, but one can say that uh, Japan spends an enormous amount of money on earthquake prevent, not just earthquake prevention, but disaster prevention of all kinds. So if Japan can't get it right, um, one wonders, you know, how much can, is humanly possible. Lucy, tell us what's happening there now. I mean, it's struck in the middle of the afternoon, Friday yeah. afternoon. People haven't been able to go home. So now, the middle of the night, are, are people yeah. sleeping in offices? What's happening? Yes. Um, well, the government early on urged people not to try to go home. Um, Japan, uh, Tokyo is a city where uh, most of the, not a lot of people, most people who work here reside outside of the city in the suburbs. And so uh, people are very reliant on what is one of the world's best public transportation systems, but that transportation system was paralyzed by the quake. Parts of it have been restored now, but still lots of it, including buses, taxis, um, you know, the, the famous bullet train, uh, the subway system have been brought to a halt or at least slowed down. So the government was urging people, don't try to go home, uh, try to stay, stay the night in your office. Um, all kinds of public facilities have been open. Concert halls, city hall, Tokyo City Hall has been opened. 
um, and refuges being Look, provided. Lucy, I'm going to interrupt you. I do apologise. This is Carl Fair in Tokyo because I want to take you over to the UN Secretary General, who's in New York, uh, Ban Ki Moon. Family and friends in the earthquake and subsequent uh, tsunami. Uh, Japan is one of the most generous and strongest, strongest benefactors coming to the assistance of those in need the world over. In that spirit, the United Nations stands by the people of Japan and we will do anything and everything we can at this very uh, difficult time. We will be watching closely as the aftershocks are felt across the Pacific and Southeast Asia uh, throughout, throughout the day. I sincerely hope that under the leadership of Pre Prime Minister Kanauto and the full support and solidarity of the international community, uh, Japanese people and government will be able to overcome this uh, difficult time as soon as possible. Nihon Seifuto Kokumini, Kokoro Karam, Aito no Yo Shoshimas. Gionga, Kono Judaina Shirao, Tori Poer, Poer Arevuto. Okay, Ban Ki Moon, there, the UN Secretary General saying that they stand by the people of Japan and will do anything necessary to help them after this devastating earthquake hit earlier on. He's answering questions now. We will talk with our uh, humanitarian coordinator's office and we will do all to mobilize uh, humanitarian assistance and disaster risk reduction teams as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll see you later. Okay, they're banking room uh, stating that, uh, of course, the UN would do all it could to help the people of Japan. Well, the earthquake, one of the biggest ever in recorded history. Uh, we'll take you live now to the British Geological Survey in Edinburgh and speak to seismologist Dr. Roger Musson. Dr. Musson, very good afternoon to you. Um, perhaps first, uh, tell us about the scale, the size of this earthquake. Uh, yes, well, at magnitude 8.9, this is the sixth largest earthquake ever recorded since instrumental seismology began in 1900. Uh, it's far and away the largest Japanese earthquake in living memory. It really is a massive event. The fault that it's come on is a very well-known fault, is it? Uh, yes, it's a, it's a major plate boundary between the Pacific Plate and the Japanese mainland and it's a particular type of fault where one plate is being pushed to destruction underneath the other one, and this is the geological situation that produces earthquakes of this size. In fact, it's the only type of fault that can produce earthquakes this large. Is that why, then, that the tsunami has been so large? Um, that's right, and the, the, the fault that broke this morning was probably about 500 kilometers long, some tens of kilometers wide, moving maybe about um, eight or nine meters. That's an enormous displacement. Um, and over that area, uh, the seabed has been given a big kick, uh, and that's just displaced a huge volume of water in both directions, producing the tsunami with such devastating effect. Has this plate moved in such a way before? Oh yes, it's been active for, uh, for a long time in, in geological history, never, never mind human history. Um, and we've seen and earthquakes like this have happened, but there hasn't been one quite this large, um, at least for the last hundred years or so. Is there any guessing why it might have done so now? Uh, it's just a matter of the fact that the energy has been building up and building up until it broke. Uh, and, and that's just a pattern that repeats over and over again. Uh, the fault will stick, the, the, the strain will build up and build up until um, it's so great that the rocks can no longer contain it, and then it breaks and, and releases a vast amount of energy in the process. In terms of aftershocks, we've heard some of those uh, registering a magnitude of six on the Richter scale. How, how long do they carry on being so big? Um, well, in fact, the largest aftershocks so far have been the magnitude seven. Um, and that's about, that's about normal, and the, the rule of thumb is that the largest aftershock is usually about one magnitude less than the size of the main shock. 
uh, give or take a little bit. So we might even not have had the largest aftershock 